Hey guys, I just want to let you know before we get into this episode that we've partnered with Band Builder Academy. Band Builder Academy is the number one place to grow your music career. Run by top label manager and Sony Vice President Todd McCarthy. So, you know it's worth it. Enter promo code CONCERTS at checkout to receive 10% off membership. Hey everybody, this is Jamie Bostell and you are listening to Concerts That Made Us. Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Welcome to the podcast, Conscience That Made Us. Interviews and stories, tales from the bus We love taking you back to when it all went down The greatest live shows and that cheering crowd sound It's concerts, concerts that made us Concerts that made us dot com On this episode I'm joined by Jamie Bostel A very busy man with not one band but two Praise the Fallen and Bostel We have a great chat all about Jamie's career and music up to this point. Once you hear Jamie's music, I know you're going to be a fan. So, without further ado, let's get on with the show.
Jamie, you're very welcome to Concerts That Made Us. Oh, hey, thanks. This is a, a first for the podcast now. We're kind of killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. One musician, two bands. Yeah, yeah. Busy. <laughs> yeah, to say the least, yeah. So we opened the show with A World Out of View, which is from Bostel. It was released back in October. Would you like to tell us a bit about it? Um, a lot of it, uh, a lot of the, the Bostel stuff started off right, right here in a bedroom studio um, during the pandemic when the bands were shut down, not doing shows. Um, I had no intentions of starting a band, but I just started to get into recording and recording stuff by myself because I had to be productive because I am used to playing shows. And when the shows stopped, I had to be productive. So I started diving into recording and writing and I had a friend who helped me invest in a computer and we got the right proper program and stuff like that. And uh, I went, I went out and got a boss Katana amp. It's great for recording as far as guitar amp and stuff. And I got all the proper plugins and stuff. And, and just my intention was just to maybe do a solo record by myself. You know, I had no intentions of putting a band cause I already had a band, you know, but then it turned into <laughs> the songs ended up being really good and people wanted to actually see it live. They're like, are we going to get to see this live? And that's like, well, uh, maybe I should put a band together for it. And my good, my good buddy, the bass player, his name is Ryan Kripe. He uh, played with me back in 1997 in a band. Uh, and he came back from the military. He's retired. He came back, moved back, says, Hey, I want to play with you. I like, well, I got the stuff I recorded, but I was really apprehensive because I was just like, who am I going to find? Because I did, I did all the, except for the drums, the drums are actually programmed. And then uh, I play guitar and I play bass and I did the vocals and all the stuff on the recordings. But I, I didn't think I was going to be able to find someone to do what I did. You know, a lot of guitar players want to do their own thing. So I was like, am I going to be able to find somebody? Because I just wanted to sing the stuff, but I wanted to write it too because it wouldn't come off the way it did unless I did write it, you know, but you know, long story short, I found, I found some guys that like it and dig it and we put it together and we decided to call it my last name. So one of the songs world out of view, it started in the bedroom studio. We put it together. Yeah. Uh, Wayne Russell is a drummer. We put it together. Wayne has a studio at his house. So we went from my bedroom studio to his studio, he's a drummer and a singer, and he plays guitar and stuff too, producer. And he's like, he produced the Praise the Fallen EP that I just did. And I happened to ask him, and I was like, hey man, would you mind playing drums in Bastel? And he's like, send me the tracks. I sent it to him. And next thing you know, the first song we recorded in a proper studio was World Out of View. Oh, man. Jeez. And What's your opinion then? Well, before this process, what would your opinion have been of home recording studios? Would you have been the type of musician that would have always preferred the proper recording studio? Yeah, you, you're talking to someone who's done it that way because I started doing this in 1990. <laughs> so in, in proper studios, I've worked with some, some really good producers. I've worked with Corey Lowry, who plays guitar for Seether. Uh, he was in Dark New Day. His brother's Clint Lowry from Seven Dust. I worked with him. I worked with uh, Chris Dimetz out of Chicago. He actually produced a Kiss Revenge record, and he's a Grammy-nominated producer. So I've worked in actual studios, too. In 2011, I met a guy. His name was Jamie Dyer, and we formed a, a band. First time I ever had heard of program drums. This guy brought me to his house. He had the studio set up in his living room. I was like, this is a studio? He's like, <laughs> yeah, check this out. And we put some of my songs together with program drums, and I thought, man... I'll never be able to do that. That looks technical as hell, you know, <laughs> yeah. but here I am, you know, I decided when my, my friend, his name's Randy Bickett, executive producer with my stuff, we call him good friend of mine. I was doing like these crappy demos for praise of fallen, just like with a boss, uh, H64 mini studio with basic drum beats, right. Just to get the ideas out. And he goes, you know, if you got a proper studio, I bet you could do some really cool stuff. And I was like, well, I knew about program drums from 2011, but I never messed with them because it looked really technical. I was really intimidated by the technicality of everything. But believe it or not, Brian, I have only recorded uh, a lot of the stuff. There was some stuff I sent you today. 
I've only recorded three years doing it myself in my bedroom studio. Jeez, man. Uh, you know, and especially the stuff I heard today, you'd imagine, like, it seems like you've been doing it all your life that way, I've you know? Up to here. I, I, I realized uh, I underestimated myself, basically. I was intimidated by technology, and being I had the time during the pandemic, I was like, you know what? I'm going to dive into this, and I'm going to learn it. Because one day I may never have a band, and I can still record and write songs, and that really makes me happy. So I decided to dive into it and I love it. I love it's a blast. Yeah, yeah. And with a band like Bostel, you know, it must be kind of almost like a freeing experience. You know, you're kind of the lead guy, you decide what happens. Yeah, I've been in I've I've had, you know, situations and in, in other bands where members leave or you have a falling out or whatever. Um so when you're just by yourself, you don't have any distractions, you know, you can focus on how you want the song to sound. There's nothing wrong with everybody's idea. Cause I work great that way too. I'm a team player, but also at the same time, you don't have somebody telling you, you should do it like this and you should do it like this. I just put my stamp on it. It's great. I record it here and then I send it to the guys. I go, okay, let's just learn it. And it's easy. It's just easier. You know, the days of standing in a room and grinding out riffs, you can still do that, and there are bands that still do that, and I still do that with PTF too. Um, but we need to get get a grip and realize, take advantage of the technology because you can do it this way too. And I learned that by doing just basic demos for PTF with the basic drum machine and <laughs> a really crappy uh, mini studio, digital studio, not the DAW that I have now and stuff. So it started there. You know, and I realized, man, this is a lot easier than standing in a room grinding out songs. You know, it's a lot easier just set the template, send it to you guys, go here, learn it, and the songs come together quicker. When you have a clear vision, you know, in your head of a band like that, that what you want it to be, you know, you have it all down to a T. Is it hard to find like minded musicians to fit into that mold? Yeah, I've had I've played in bands before. I, I wrote the songs, I brought it to a guitar player. And if they're in the metal or like a Megadeth style or something, they take over and are like, here, I think you should do this with your song. And it doesn't, it takes what you created away. It still ends up being good because I've done that with people. I was like, it's still good, but it's not what I originally wrote. And it's not really what I had in mind. I can make it work, but it's not really what I genuinely wrote. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, I can do it. I can do it that way to satisfy a guitar player, say, you know, that's why I started playing guitar because guitar players would take my songs and turn it into like Megadeth or Dream Theater or something. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to just write a commercially viable hard rock song, you know, something oh, three minutes, four minutes long, you know, making the list, the listener listen right away. You know, I've been in prog bands where, musicians show off and it's musicians are mainly the ones that listen to that kind of music <laughs> you know yeah yeah i get you i get you <laughs> and as you mentioned praise the fall you're also the front man how did praise the fall come to be wow well it, it started in 2009 uh crazy i was in another band at the time um actually with a guy who actually uh you talked to the band Choke Setter. Yeah. The guitar player that's in Choke Setter played with me in a oh, band. Small yeah. World. That was a band that opened for Stain in Three Days Grace. We were called Signal. I was in a band at the time with him. And um, we did some great things and stuff like that. But every Thursday, they just had an open mic night at a local bar here in Mishawaka, Indiana. And just to get my fix, because I, I was writing back then. But what I write compared to what we were doing, they didn't really like, I guess, in a way, or it didn't fit really. So I would just go to open jams and to get my fix and to show like an audience, let's see what they think of this stuff. You know, I know my band's not going to play it because we were like a heavy metal band compared to the stuff I was writing was more pop rock commercial, like the stuff I write now, you know? And, uh, Little did I know, man, I went to an open jam 
uh, I was jamming with a drummer, a longtime friend that played with me. And he's like, let's go to just, let's go to open jam. All the musicians was just go to open jam on Thursday and hang out and, and go up and jam like three songs. All I had was a drummer, me on acoustic. We went up there and we wrote on the paper, praise the fallen. We were just praise the fallen. We had a bass player that was already there jamming, whatever. Long story short, this guy walks in, long blonde hair, you know, he ha- he happened to be the guitar player for Lillian X. Oh, man. Yeah. MCA recording artist Lillian X. Lillian X is still out now. Stevie Blaze is, uh, re- you know, John, John Sturr was his name. He came to me and he was like, uh, he came to me and he said, uh, wow, he goes, uh, I know who you are. He's a singer for Signal. I'm like, yeah. I go, he goes, well, what's up with these songs? I'm like, well, these are songs that don't really fit that band. So I just come to open jam, play them, see what people think, you know. But at the time, we were actually in a studio just recording a rough demo just to just to hear them. Basically, honestly, I just because, like I said, it didn't fit my band. They didn't want them. But I was like, well, I'm going to go record them and just see just for self-satisfaction, I guess. I went to the actual studio, a uh, low, low cost studio, a friend of ours, he played bass on it. And then my friend played drums and I literally just played acoustic. It was stripped down raw just to get the song idea recorded, just to listen to it together and go, what do I got here? You know, and it was a really rough demo, you know, and I asked John, I was like, well, would you come in the studio and, uh, would you come in the studio and help me do guitars? Cause I wasn't really a guitar player, man. And he was like, he goes, F that. He goes, we're going to uh, do an album and we're going to form a band. I was like, Oh wow. So there you go. It started in 2009. He knew a friend out in St. Joe, Michigan. We went and recorded an eight song. It's actually on Spotify. It's the gray one with the shield. Yeah. That's John Stir from William X on guitar on that. But those are songs I wrote, and we put them together, and that's when Praise the Fallen was born. I took a break from Praise the Fallen because John had moved to Texas. He was also in a band called Brandy Machine, and uh, he went back to Dallas, Texas. Uh, 2000, I, I was I trucked around with a band in Chicago called Blind Spot for a while. I was driving to Chicago every weekend for three years from South Bend. Huh. Yeah. Played everywhere uh, with that band. Worked with Chris Steinmetz. I, I worked with the uh, the drummer that is now in the band Enough's Enough. Yeah, I was doing a lot of big stuff. And uh, anyway, I was doing Blind Spot, focused on Blind Spot, whatever. And then John had passed away. 2014, John passed away. The old drummer from Praise of Fallen came back and he's like, dude, we got to play his memorial. I'm like, okay. So that's when I grabbed my friend. Uh, his name was Jeff Sorgenfry. He had just passed away. That's the guy I went to the funeral last week. He filled in on guitar. We reformed Praise of Fallen because Blind Spot had broken up. The drummer left us and joined Enough's Enough. So the band was done. So I didn't have a band. Lo and behold, this memorial happens. Praise of Fallen plays it. People are there. Some people from LA, some people from Dallas. They were like, you need to keep this going. This stuff's really good. So I kept it going. Went through quite a few lineups to get to the guys I have now. And Praise the Fallen has been back since 2014. You know, something that really kind of boggles my mind is how do you manage two bands? You know, it's like having one band takes up like all your time. How do you actually have two bands and still have time for a life? Well, I have I have two days I practice. We practice Wednesdays and Sundays. Sundays we practice noon to two. Wednesdays we practice six to eight. Uh, sometimes we don't always make Wednesday rehearsals. We've got like Praise the Fallen has like thirty eight almost. Well, now we got some new stuff. So we got like forty five songs to choose from. Um, we've been a lot of this material has been written over a period of time, and we just we do our homework too. We. We work on the stuff, tighten the stuff at home, whatever. We know within that two hours, we've got, we've got two hours to work, and we do that. The Bostel stuff, yeah, um, well, when you're professional, you pretty much, you don't have to, because I used to, I used to practice three days a week with a band. I used to think you had to do that. You have to practice three days a week or you're not serious. 
I learned that if you do your homework, if each member does their homework at home and works on their parts and knows what they're doing, when you get together, you know, basically you just jam through the song. So it doesn't take much time. I mean, I literally, Praise the Fallen practices four hours a week. That's nothing. Really. Yeah, that's not. Like I said, like the Bostel stuff where I put it together, send it to them. Like, we're going to be doing that song. Uh, I sent you the song Angry Anymore. We're going to start recording that on Tuesday. Wayne and I are. What you heard on that song was just me. And then he's going to do the drum tracks and him and I are going to do it on, on uh, Tuesday. Not every song guitar solo. I have lead players. You know, I've got, I've got uh, Dennis Kilton on guitar. Uh, plays an eight string uh, Strandberg. He's a really good guitar player. He did the solo in World Out of View and stuff. He's, we have a band. He is in the band. He is a lead player. Not every song has a guitar solo, though. So, Bastel compared to the Praise of Fallen stuff, Bastel has more ambience, loops, and stuff like that, electronics. Whereas Praise of Fallen is a straight up rock band, straight up guitars, bass, drums, vocals, you know. So, it work is how I balance it. And usually, Bastel just rehearses. Let's say we have a show, we rehearse that week of the show. But in between that, we're working on the stuff at home. So, that's how we manage our time. <laughs> right, right. Jeez, fair play to you for being able to manage it, though. And, you know, how do you approach writing music for two bands? You know, the songwriting, what's your process? Well, like Praise the Fallen now, uh, at first, you know, because I did Praise the Fallen, pretty much I ran Praise the Fallen myself. It went my songs. But now, like this last EP, the Degenerate Types EP, the song Keep Your Distance that's on there, it's a metal song, kind of. Andy wrote that, the guitar player. And Andy helped write the lyrics, too. And I think, I think that's great. Uh, Andy, basically, like I said, I, I held the reins for the writing for a while until I seen the guitar player was actually going to stay. And Andy's been in the band four years so he earned that badge. You know what I mean? It's like, write a song, dude. Structure it. Bring it. We'll put it together. And this is your band, too. But before, when I wasn't sure if a guitar player was going to stick around. Also, you know, I did a lot of the held the reins for the writing because if they left, we would still continue as a three piece. And I would make sure I could I would do something that was easy enough that I could sing, too, because I play guitar and sing at the same time. So we've been through. Uh, guitar players dipping and that's fine I'll hold it down until we find another one and we'll just play like Nirvana style <laughs> <laughs> so we never stopped you mentioned earlier on you uh, popular rock is what you like to do you know get to the hook quick and everything what way do you approach structuring a song to make sure it appeals to a wide audience well a lot a lot of it Brian uh, I learned like through like i told you i worked with Corey lowry i've worked with chris dimas i've worked these people taught me you know i was also i was also the guy that you know when i first was in a band i was with a guitar player that wanted to be different and weird and didn't want to do commercial rock so i kind of started that way to where everything had to be deep and intricate and stuff and then i realized the only people that come and watch it are musicians <laughs> you know and uh i just was like for me, I don't know. It started out as just like writing songs in my living room on the acoustic guitar and just simple stuff. But I, what I learned through these producers that I worked with, they said the first line has to grab the listener. Make sure whatever you say, the first thing that comes off your lips, make sure it grabs the listener and get to that hook. Don't make them wait forever to get to the chorus. You know what I mean? And at the same time, a lot of the songs, like the Bostel stuff, it's short. It's short for a reason. You know, as these generations are getting older, the attention span's getting shorter. That's why we see the TikTok stuff, 15-second videos and stuff like that. Their songs are like 15 seconds now because it's getting to the point because the attention span is short. So I've been in the bands that write seven-minute songs and stuff and opuses and stuff, and it's like... That's cool and it's fun for a musician, but you have to think of the listener. 
think of the audience that is, you know, the average audience. They don't want to spend seven minutes of their life listening to you noodle around on a guitar. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, those days are gone, sadly. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I know when I went to a Dream Theater concert, James LeBride was like, how many of you out there are musicians? The whole audience raised their hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> so at this point we'll dive into your own personal history when it comes to music to see where you came from so if you can can you tell us your earliest musical memory you know i thought of, i thought about this because i've been listening to your interview for a while and i kind of wanted to avoid it because it tells my age <laughs> but no joke i saw donnie and marie man Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw Donnie and Marie. That was my first concert. But then my second concert was Poison. Right, a step up, a step up. <laughs> when I saw Poison, that's when I was like, I wanted to be a rocker. And I saw Poison back in the day when they had, you know, the fire the fire poles and stuff and slides. And it's crazy. It was awesome, you know? Yeah. Jeez, I'd <laughs> say so. And... um did you grow up in a musical house? You know, was there always music being played? I mean, my mom liked Motown and she listened to music like that and stuff, but none of them, like I had a half brother and I had a half sister. You know, my stepdad was a steel worker, a uh, laborer. Um, my mother, uh, my mother, I don't, she was a bartender, really. She didn't, she didn't do music. I, uh, my real father, because I found out I had a real father. My real father, I guess he tried music. I didn't meet him till I was 21. And uh, when I met him, I found out he wasn't really that good. <laughs> but he was kind of like a Willie Nelson style or something. But yeah, but I never knew my real father. But my stepdad, I remember he listened to like Steely Dan and ZZ Top and Al Jarreau and stuff like that. Records would be around, you know. Thriller, Jethro Tull. Um, so I remember stuff like that. But as far as anybody in in the house playing an instrument, I was the only one. I started out playing trumpet. Fourth grade, uh, middle school, played trumpet. I was attracted to the drums. I learned drums when I was in high school. I taught myself how to play drums. Uh, just was curious about everything, you know, and I just learned. I played French horn. Too. I was a section leader in marching band. I played flugelhorn. Uh, so also, I think that's also what regimented me about the rehearsal thing. Because when you're marching band, you know, they were very, rehearsals were very regimented, you know. This night we rehearsed, we rehearsed three hours, three hours, you know. But I do remember my mom, when I got my trumpet, my mom made me rehearse as soon as I got home from school. I had to rehearse for an hour, I think it was. And then I'd eat dinner and I had to rehearse after dinner too. So it was already instilled in me at a young age that rehearsal was important. Yeah. It's kind of a, a funny one though, because I hear some people say when it's regimented that much, it actually turns them against the instrument. No, I, I when I got the trumpet, I was like, I, I had said I was going to be the best trumpet player in the world. <laughs> I didn't know. I, I seriously didn't know that I would fall into rock and roll. I really didn't. I mean, I dabbled in stuff with a friend of mine. You know, we we would go to the local music store and we'd rent a keyboard and a, and a recording machine and stuff. And let he, he did that. And I would sing a little bit, but I wasn't really a singer. So I would do it because we were there. Something to do. We were bored, whatever. And like I said, drum machines, like Dr. Rhythm drum machine and stuff, like straight up straight beats and stuff we make silly songs and stuff and i wasn't even thinking about a band thing it was just something to do we we're musicians that's what you did you know and then uh, i was in the talent i was in my my very first performance was in high school we did poisons talk dirty to me and that was the first time playing ever i was not uh in show choir or nothing nothing i just like took it on they're like let's do and let's form a band and do the high school talent show. Found a guitar player. My friend played bass on the keyboards. Took a drummer from marching band that played drum kit. And we did Talk Dirty to Me. 
Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First time I ever sang, I was 15. And then my first actual rock band was in 1990. Um, I was in the military. I got out of the military and I tried to live in Sacramento, California. And all I saw, this was 1990. All I seen was original bands. So my whole world was, I went from a little town of Chesterton, Indiana to Sacramento, California. And all I seen was original music. And I thought that's just the way it is. I didn't know there were cover bands out there till later. You know, I started out straight out the gate doing my own songs, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like, well, I assume that would be the easier way of doing it, really. You know, instead of learning everybody else's songs, just focus all your time on making your own songs. Right. Well, it just kind of happened accidentally because I ended up joining, you know, long story short, met this guy in the Air Force. He played guitar. And he's like, dude, I need a singer. He had to spell the bands through this music store in California. And uh, we were judged by, I guess, Jeff Pilson was there. And it was uh, one of the members from Dokken was one of the judges. And, you know, long story short, we got second place. And I just sang for them just to help them out because they lost their singer and they were in this battle of bands literally the next day. And he's like, dude, I need you. I need you to come like tonight. We need to rehearse and the show tomorrow. And I was like, okay. Now, mind you, just in between that, I'd always just dabbled with a four track and did little keyboard songs and stuff like that. It, I seriously didn't even I was not even serious about music. You know, I was a drummer. I was like, I want to be a drummer. But I would do little songs with keyboards and drum machines on my four track just just to be creative, I guess, you know. And I so I sang a little bit. This guy knew that. He's like, can you sing? I was like. I guess I can try. I haven't sang since the high school talent show. You know? So I went out, sang. We got second place. And that was 1990. And from then on, I was a singer. And sang in bands, sang in bands. You know, came to South Bend, joined a band. We did covers and originals. It was called Dead Day. And I sang, pretty much just sang for bands. But I was also writing on the drop d tuning real simple tuning uh for beginners on guitar just to get song ideas out i was inspired by nirvana you know i thought man that dude can do it i know i can you know so i would just write songs you know basically just for myself i guess you know then i started to bring it to the band this is how it started i would bring it to the band and say hey you're the guitar player can you do this? And I would just show him, you know, and it was not as good as him. So I would have him do it and I would just sing. Right. Eventually years go by guitar players come and go. Finally I got tired of guitar players quitting on me. I was like, I'm going to amp, I'm going to guitar and I'm going to me. And that's where I'm. So, yeah. I see. I see. And, you know, what's your local music scene like is there much competition is it hard to kind of get ahead with a band uh there's some good bands here man there's some good there's not a lot of venues there's more cover band venues than our original band venues there's a couple original band venues here but yeah there's there's some bands that are still figured out that we need to work together some of them are still competing and it's not about that that's why like i'm doing some stuff i think i sent you that other song uh things i'm chasing it's called uh it's kind of foo fighter sounding or whatever like i'm collaborating with a guitar player that plays in a cover band here just to show people that's what music's about it's about collaborating unity together you know there are some bands that are getting that and are cool like that and then there's some bands, I'm sure, and you know, I don't know what your scene's like, but it's everywhere. They have this idea that it's a battle of the bands. And I don't think, if you look back, I don't think it's helped that places have started this battle of the bands because that's still in people's heads. Well, it's competitive. We need to compete. We don't need to compete. I have the attitude that if I put a band on a show with us, it's our show together. It's not just a Praise the Fallen show or a Boss Cell show. It's everybody's show together. You know what I mean? All 
all the bands, let's say you got four bands on that show, all four bands are just as important as the main one. Yeah. Well, it's called a music community for a reason. You know, I think across the board, it should be everybody supports each other. You know, if one band starts to get ahead, they should bring the rest with them, you know? Right. Well, there's some some people, you know, you know, maybe I'll ruffle some feathers here. It's either jealousy, insecurity, the, the insecurity, the insecurity causes jealousy, you know, when they should actually be like, hey, how did you get there? Can you help me get there? You know, for me, if anybody were to ask, I love helping people. Just come ask me. I'll help you. I'll tell you how I did it. And a lot of it, too, there are a lot of there's a lot of people out there that want it really bad, but they don't understand the work ethic. You have to work, man. How bad you want it? Well, as bad as you want it, you got to put that much work into it. Yeah. You know, and then more. Sit on the couch and say they want to be a rock star, but they're not doing nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly, exactly. For every musician out there, there's what about a hundred guys sitting on a couch saying I want to be a rock star. Oh yeah. They're still living on their mama's couch. I say for, for like 10 years, I had that idea. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And um, if there's any advice I can give a band, travel, get out of town. If you're sitting in town for 10 years and still uh, sleeping on your mama's couch, you know, you need to get out of town. If you believe in yourself that much, then you need to take it to a city where nobody's ever heard you and see how you hold up. You know, I can say that because I was like that myself. I was here in South Bend. I played South Bend for 10 years and I, I finally decided, I don't know, something just clicked in me where I was like, well, if I believe in myself so much, I need to go to Chicago, say Chicago's not too far away. It's a big city. There's opportunity. I'm going to go to Chicago where nobody's ever heard me and see how my band holds up. We ended up holding up great. Next thing you know, we're traveling everywhere. Next thing you know, you're becoming a name, you know. And next thing you know, you don't come back home for a year. <laughs> <laughs> as far as playing a hometown show, you know. Yeah. I love traveling. I love playing out of town. South Bend, like I said, there's not a lot to offer here. A lot of it is sports bars. Notre Dame's here. So it's sports bars. Manufacturing's big here with the RV capital of the world and Elkhart. So it's manufacturing, it's a blue collar, you know, so that's what you're going to get here. And you decide, man, I want to make it music. Well, I'm not telling you you have to get out of South Bend. You, you can live here, but I would suggest traveling. Chicago's only an hour and a half away. You got Cleveland, you've got Detroit, you've got all these big cities right here around us. Why not, you know, take your music to the masses? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And before we jump into your concert experiences, you've had, as you've mentioned, you've had a long history in music. And you were in a band called Signal, where you put out six albums, were sponsored by Jägermeister. And you, as you mentioned, you supported the likes of Stain, Three Days Grace, to name a few. What was that time in your life like? You know, that must have been a time now where you were really starting to feel like a rock star. Man, well, I, I'll never forget it, you know. And I get, I get crap for this sometimes. People are like, man, the first time you, the first time you meet Jamie, he's gonna tell you what he over for staying. Hell yeah, I am. I'm proud of. Him. We played in front of fifteen thousand people. They look like ants, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, but that was the biggest twenty minutes of my life, you know. I'm never gonna forget it. It was amazing. It was a blessing and a curse, though. I tell people because. Yeah, it's awesome. It happened. It was an experience. But once you had it, man, you want it again and again. And you work so hard and sometimes ambition can get in your way. You know what I mean? You can drive other people away because you're pushing so hard, you know. And I have personally have done that, you know, and had to go back and say, man, I'm sorry. I worked you too hard, you know, or whatever. But yeah, man, that was a great experience. I've opened for a lot, a lot of nationals. I'm I'm very blessed and I'm very grateful. And uh but the same, yeah, that time of my life was crazy, Brian, because I was in my mid-30s. You know, usually stuff like that happens for people in their 20s, you know. I was 30, I don't know, I think I was 38. 
Yeah, close to 40, man. And I come from a little town. It's called Chesterton, Indiana, Northwest Indiana, like just about an hour from Chicago, 45 minutes, you know, and it's a nothing town. There is no music scene there or nothing, you know. Uh, Yeah. So to come to go from that to just this area, like I said, is not a lot to offer to go from that to that happening. All I can say is there's anybody out there who doesn't think they can do it. I'm living proof. No matter where you're from, if you believe in yourself, you believe in your heart, you can get there. Exactly. And I think it goes to show that as well, you're never too old. If you were 38 when it started happening, you know? Yeah. 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 I think I look pretty good for my age. I'm still doing it. You know, I'm still alive. I'm still making rock music that's, that fits the times, you know, praise the fallen is doing great. We got almost 900 followers monthly right now on Spotify and that's through playlists right now. And, uh, it's, we got one song It's called changes. It's doing really well. And, uh, I noticed because I can check through the distro kid what ages are listening to us, and it said ages twenty eight to thirty four. That age group seems to be like I don't know maybe they're the age group that's most technologically aware or something. But even on the podcast, that's like my highest uh, group of listeners, and I know a couple of friends I have. It's twenty eight to thirty four as well. That's their listeners you know maybe they're just the the podcast and music generation nowadays yeah i i i, I like that though you know there was a few people over 60 i was like huh <laughs> <laughs> not many though you know because we're we're hard rock you know but yeah my experience at that time it was also a lot of work we worked hard i mean we never said no to anything as far as shows We got offered something. We said, yes, we said, yes, we never said no. We were constantly that time in my life. My God, I was working in a factory, single dad, living by myself, uh, traveling every weekend. I mean, we would go, I mean, we would go, geez, to Kentucky over the weekend and come back on Monday and go to work. Sometimes we do a show on a Sunday. Sometimes we do two shows in the same day. It was a demand for us, and especially being the Jägermeister sponsorship, that was crazy, too. A lot of free Jägermeister. <laughs> <laughs> but we had, I, I did a, a few dates with the Cult, too. Played in Cleveland, played the Orbit Room in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I played the Fox Theater in Detroit. So I got to, I got to be on some stages that normal bands wouldn't be able to be on, you know. The Jägermeister sponsorship was nice. They treated us well, and it was uh, it was some memories I'll never forget for sure. Yeah, and I have to ask. I'm sure listeners are dying to know what was it like to share the stage with so many big name bands. It's awesome. I mean, one of the I was just thinking today. Uh, one of my one of my favorite artists that I opened for, I actually opened for him. I think a month ago, uh, acoustically by myself was John Karabi the guy who took Vince Neil's place in Motley Crue. He's so cool, man, because he actually, well, for one, I opened for him twice. And the second time I opened for him, he remembered me. And then after he was done, he actually hung out with me. And his son, Robbie, actually hung out with me too. And I think that is cool. You know, there are some rock stars, I won't say their names, that, you know, aren't cool. (laughs) You know, forget, they kind of forget where they came from, you know, but for the most part, most of the artists I've opened for have been pretty cool. I've opened for some majors, Puddle of Mud. Uh, God, man. Yeah, so many. Adam Gontier, Three Days Grace. I opened for him acoustic, too. I opened for Three Days Grace with Signal, but then I opened for him with Praise the Fallen acoustic when he, he did an acoustic tour. Uh, man, I opened for Prong. I opened for... A lot, man. Saliva, open for saliva. Mm. Hoobastank, open for them. There's so many, man. <laughs> a lot of them are coming through, and they're on the way to the bigger cities, and they'll pass through here. And uh, I think it's because when you do something that's commercially viable like me, 
those are the kind of bands they want commercially viable music to open for them. Yeah, true. There's a lot of, there's nothing wrong with death metal and stuff, but you're not going to have a death metal band open for Puddle of Mud. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's like any band in town, you know, but if it's, usually that's how the shows go. And that's how I've, I've gotten the opportunities I've gotten. Plus it helped my signal resume helped, you know, doing the same stuff like that got me in some doors too. And just developing relationships with people, with promoters. And a lot of these promoters started out that I work with now. They started out back when I was in signal and they're still around. So um, I became their friend and, Next thing you know, they're having my band do shows, you know, like we're opening for Tantric in March, you know. And I have to ask, was there ever any possibility of touring overseas in them days? Man, I mean, I would love to. (laughs) That would be awesome. But the reality, the reality of all that, of all the touring thing, like I had told you earlier, I was a single dad paying child support, working in a factory. So I was like, okay. You know, I've got responsibilities, at least until this boy's 19. So I'll just play on the weekends. If something happens where a label comes along and they can pay my bills, pay my rent, because that's reality, man. I'm just going to be real with you. I got to be able to pay my bills and be on the road. If I can't do that, well, then the best thing to do is just do it the way I've been doing it. You know, so how do you measure success? I'd say I've been pretty successful uh, opening for all these nationals. A lot of these nationals know my name. A lot of them, there's industry people that talk to me all the time. They know, you know, I got responsibilities. I have a family now. I'm married now. You know, that's reality. Re- reality sets in eventually. There's a lot of artists out there that I know that were out there that toured and stuff. They gave up the touring because they missed their family on Christmas and birthdays and That's the reality of all that. So my whole thing is, would I go to Europe? If it's paid for, it's covered. Yeah, let's do it, man. (laughs) (laughs) No, I can do it. I can get vacation time and go out there. But as far as like three month tour or something, well, then I'd have to sacrifice my job, you know? Yeah, and that's the thing that people outside the industry wouldn't realize as well that, you know, there's kind of a misconception that if you go on a European tour, you're automatically like a big shot millionaire musician. But most times it actually costs the musician money to go on a European tour. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. And how are you going to get all your equipment over there and stuff like that? All that costs money. Yeah, and flights are not cheap and you got to stay out there and yeah, all that. I mean, maybe back in the 90s, back when Nirvana was going to Europe and stuff, it was cheaper, but it isn't now, that's for sure. You know, and it's just, I don't know. That's my whole thing. It's like, if someone covers it and they want to, they sponsor us or whatever, yeah, we're all about it. But the reality is I would have to take a few vacation days or something to do that, you know, because we all have responsibilities as we get older. As you get older, you get more responsibilities. Exactly, exactly. You know, I usually ask as well how my guests dealt with the pandemic. You know, it was the music industry was decimated worldwide. No gigs, no, no anything really. But you had a pretty extreme experience. You got COVID and you're you're actually lucky to be sitting here right now. Yeah, um, it was uh, I can remember right. It was like it was like a Sunday. It was the night before. No, that's what it was. I woke up Monday morning, ready to go to work like normal. I had a fever. I'm like, man, I feel really hot, you know. And uh, I already knew because they were doing, they were checking temperatures at work and stuff. And they, if you, they were going to test you on the spot, you wouldn't be working. I'm not one to miss work. I've literally missed one day this whole year. And, uh, I'm like, man, I know they're going to stop me in the door, so I better just call them and tell them I'm not feeling good. So, I don't know. I drank some water all day. A friend of mine told me he had gotten it, and all he did was drink water, and he was fine. So, okay, I'll take some ibuprofen, drink some water, do the normal thing men do. We're like, you know, we're stubborn. We're like, throw a cold rag on my head. I'll be all right, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I did that, and I slept all day on the couch. And uh, my wife, 
the next morning, no, that night she checked, she checked my oxygen. She's, she's a medical assistant at the time. And, uh, she had an oximeter, checks your oxygen in your finger, you know, put on there. And she said, your oxygen's 73. And she's like, if it gets any lower, you're going to have to go to the hospital. Next morning, I wake up. She checks it. My oxygen's 69. Nice. So I, I was like, uh, call an ambulance, right? She's like, no, I'm not going to do that. She flew. She did like 90 miles an hour to the hospital, went to the emergency room. I go in there, just do the normal thing. I'm not even thinking that I'm going to get hospitalized. I'm thinking, oh, they'll just give me some medicine and I'll be all right, you know, because this was all new, you know, to everybody. Nobody knew anything. Well, uh, they're like, we're admitting you. They put me in a room. Uh, they gave me Tylenol every four hours. You know, I was in embryonic states, cold chills, sweating. It was terrible. I was like, man, what's going on? Next thing you know, someone came in the room. They put me in a bed and they slammed me down the hallway. And I was like, what's going on? I, I was still coherent. I was like, what's going on? They're like, we're taking you to ICU. I'm like, what? I'm like, this is that serious? I thought I just had a fever and this was going to go away, you know? You got COVID-19, you know, and uh, they attached me to a machine, a ventilator and, and that. And I was like freaking out because these people are around me in hazmat suits and they're putting these hoses and they're attaching an IV to me. And, you know, it felt like E.T. or something. <laughs> I was like, and I'm like, what's going on? He's like, we're I'm putting a ventilator on you. I'm like, OK, you know, I didn't even know what a ventilator was. I never even heard of it, you know okay and they put oxygen in me and stuff next thing you know i don't remember seriously i don't remember the next few days i woke up like a few days later or something like that it was foggy you know i remember looking down my legs were like like birds like bird legs i lost 45 pounds in a matter of like five days oh man yeah it was like crazy i was like i was like whoa you know i was like i'm on a covid diet but no <laughs> <laughs> but it was like i don't know they came in there and they told me some i think it was called proning or something they wanted me to lay on my chest and wanted to lay lay on my face and i had to breathe that way and it was crazy they had me do that they, they took the ventilator off me and they put oxygen. I had oxygen on and it was just a process to where it would take oxygen to stand up. It would take oxygen to even lift yourself on your toes. Right. And your oxygen would drop. I remember not to be disgusting, but just going to the bathroom and my oxygen dropping and being so scared that I was, just, you felt like you were reaching for air. Oh, and here I am. I don't smoke. I barely drink. I'm super healthy. How did this happen? You know, just happen. And I remember looking at the doctor and I remember saying, just be straight up with me, man. Am I going to make it? He looked right at me, Brian, said, we don't know. Oh, man, that must have been scary. It was very scary. And I, I could have let that get the best of me. But at the time, I, in my mind, I was like, okay, I got to be mentally strong and tell myself, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to make it. And it started right then and there. I was like, no, I'm going to beat this. <clears throat> and uh, even though I said that to myself, it was still hard. Uh, like I said, there was people, these guys that came and did physical therapy, they called it, right? And just taking one step your oxygen would drop just standing up. I couldn't stand up. I mean, it, that I was that weak. It was terrible. Finally, I got uh, my oxygen got up enough to where I could go home. And then I was on oxygen for three months at home. And two weeks after I was home, you know, my wife, she left me here. I was on oxygen. I was watching a lot of TV, just sitting on the couch, uh, Literally, oh well, I'll I, I tell you what. The first night I got home, uh, there's three steps in a the garage to get in the house. Literally, just three 
steps. And I remember looking from the car and I thought, you know, by this time the hospital let me go. Shouldn't be a problem to go up the stairs because I got the oxygen on. No, the oxygen dropped, right? Yeah. I told my wife, I'm like, get me. There was a bar stool in the kitchen. to give me that bar stool. I had to sit down. So I sat down, let my oxygen get back up to the 80s. And then I took like six steps. Oxygen would drop again. And I sit in the bar stool again. And I would just move it across. The, and this is just going across my kitchen. Get to the living room. Seemed miles away. That's how bad it was to give you an, you know, to give you an example you know, to describe it. And I was, you know, you know, I had to urinate in a bottle and it was terrible, <laughs> but um, I'm on the couch, having to watch, just watching TV. And, you know, like I said, just go to the bathroom, cross the living room was scary. I was scared the oxygen was going to drop. Eventually, um, the problem was I was looking at the oximeter constantly. My wife told me, like, if you stop looking at that, you know, and don't overthink it. You're going to get better. So uh, finally, I just said, okay, scratch this. I'm not going to look at it no more. And I'm just going to go for it. Finally, I started to get a little, little bit stronger and stronger day by day. About two weeks after being home, um, I had to know. I was on the couch. I was like, I got this song in the studio right now that I want to finish. I have to know if I can sing yet. You know, I did a song. If you get the official site, it's a song. It's called Side of Our Soul. I did that song while on oxygen. And once I seen that I could sing, something in me, I just became more confident going, okay, I'm going to be all right. And I had a, a, a nurse come here. I think it was once a week and do exercises with me and walk me across my living room, literally just walking across my living room. Okay, we're good for the day, like 30 minute exercise and that's it. And it would take it would take all my energy to do that. And here you are in your mind wondering, like, man, am I ever gonna be normal again? Yeah. You know, suddenly I just started getting better and stronger and stronger. She told me it took about that's what it took about 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 90 days, about three months for people to return back to normal, the other people that she worked with. So yeah, that, that stuff's real, man. Because I remember when I started and I saw people wearing masks. I'm like, what's this? You know, I was like, these people are paranoid or something. <laughs> so it was a wake-up call for me, too. Definitely, definitely. And were you left with any, you know, remaining side effects? Or are you 100% back to normal now? I don't have any side effects, People I've heard, I've had, I actually have a friend that lives in Valparaiso that her hair was falling out and stuff. She had like the COVID long symptoms. Her hair was falling out and stuff. And she's like, you have any side effects? I'm like, no, I'm very, very lucky. Yeah. They did an MRI on me and everything afterwards. They checked everything out and everything's normal. I went to the doctor actually, cause I just got over a, a upper respiratory infection and it lasted longer than normal. And I thought maybe it was because I had scar tissue, right? And I had a chest x-ray done and they said it was clear. So I'm very lucky. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, well, thank God you got through it and made it. Yeah, it was very scary. My my wife, uh, my doctor was uh, the, do the doctor my wife worked for. Because at the time she was a medical assistant. She worked for this doctor that was my doctor. And she was asking him, is he going to make it? And he was telling her, preparing her, no, he's probably not going to make it. And then when he did, he was like, it's a miracle you're here. So I believe in miracles now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I didn't want to be the miracle, but I believe in them now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get a bit more positive now. For any listeners that haven't seen you live, what can they expect at one of your shows? High energy. Good vocals, good songs. Uh, we have fun up there. Uh, people can see that we're, we're a good team and we all get along. Um, Praise the Fallen puts on an awesome show. Bostel is an awesome, awesome experience. Uh, you're going to see we got Bostel scrims and a bass drum graphic. Uh, 
Uh, Wayne is a showman on the drums for sure. Uh, just both of my both of my bands are solid. The songwriting is the main focus for me, though. I make I make for sure that the songs are strong. I wanted to tell. Actually, let me grab this real quick. I've got vinyl. Ah. Before it was called Bastel, we had the idea that we were just going to put out. My buddy's like, dude, you should put some of these songs out on vinyl. So we got two songs on 12-inch vinyl, Jamie Bastel. We have Down the River and Vendetta on 12-inch vinyl. Oh, man. Took here to get these. <laughs> <laughs> and are they available for fans to get? Yeah. They can just contact me. They're sitting in my they're in boxes right here. I got like 300 of them. <laughs> you know, it's concerts that made us. So we have to hear about the concerts that have made you. You know, is there a show that in your head you revisit as the perfect show? Man, I've seen a lot of concerts, but I've also been a part of a lot of concerts too. So... Man, that's a hard one for me because I because I'm usually part of it. <laughs> I have to let me think about that. I think I think uh, one of the most uh, eye opening concerts for me that I saw that really made me want to. Well, it wanted me. It made me want to play guitar and sing. You know, electric guitar the way I do now, and that when I saw the Foo Fighters with the Red Hot Chili Peppers at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington. And I think that was in, it was a Californication tour. So whatever year that album came out in the Nothing Left to Lose album. I want to say, is that 99? I think it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, definitely not around 99 anyway. It was late 90s. I thought I saw the Foo Fighters and I was like, oh my God. It was, yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> I have to ask, what was it like seeing the Foo Fighters at that stage in their career? You know, they were still fairly fresh. Man, they they looked like they were having a party up there. You know, it was it was pretty crazy. There were some naked girls and stuff on the stage and stuff. Like that. <laughs> oh yeah, um, you know, Dave was young in his prime, and and uh, and I love that album for one. But oh man, they did the energy just the yeah they had an the energy and they did it that that tour they did you know how the queen has a the, those colored lights you see like the i think it was a wembley or whatever the color the big 80s style colored lights foo fighters had that set up for that show too and that was back when they were wearing like white or i think it wore red shirts with black ties and stuff everything just uniform and it was just it was just sick man <laughs> Jeez, I seen them back in, geez, I think it was 2019. And, you know, they definitely haven't lost it. You know, they're just as entertaining. I had tickets to see them in Indianapolis still uh, when Taylor passed away. I had to cancel because I'm not going to go. Well, they canceled after that happened. So I had to get money back. But I'm still looking forward to seeing them again. I think it was last year last summer yeah i was so excited to see them yeah do you think they'll um they'll continue on i was talking to somebody about this the other day i think the the thing that they the tribute that they did went over so well that i think what they'll do is the, the remaining members will probably just have special guest drummers maybe maybe what they'll do is like okay on this tour we're gonna have this drummer the next tour, we're going to have this drummer. You know what I mean? They could do that. I mean, it could be the way it is for them, you know, from now on. Uh, he told, oh, it was Wayne. It was my drummer, Wayne. He told me that he saw an interview with Chris Shiflett, and I guess he spilled that they're working on a new record, is what I heard. Oh. I suppose that's probably the best thing, you know, and it's a mark of respect to Taylor not to replace him. I'm sure Taylor would want them to go on. So, I mean, there were rumors at the time that, that were said that he would he wanted to get out of touring, you know, so possibly, who knows, that might have started back then, you know. So even if Taylor would have, would have been still alive and he left, I'm sure he would have wanted them to go on, you know what I mean? And I'm sure they 
short of. They're a machine, man. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And not to get negative now, but we have to hear the bad with the good. So what's the worst gig experience you've had? And if it was one of your own shows, how did you overcome it? That's funny you ask me that. Because I had a show recently uh, that was probably our worst gig. <laughs> right. I'm not going to tell you where. And I'm not trying to ruffle no feathers or anything. We had a situation where the venue didn't have a regular in-house sound guy. So the sound guy wasn't familiar with the setup, basically. And he fumbled around a lot, uh, messing around with certain cables and stuff. And we were on stage ready to go. Because when you open for Nationals, you get a 15-minute time set up in between each band. You have 15 minutes. And this guy basically, he didn't, he was fumbling around looking for cables and stuff and sucking up our time. Uh, next thing you know, we're told that we have five minutes to play. So we drove an hour and a half to a venue to play two songs. Uh, we weren't happy at all. Uh, I wouldn't think so. Jeez, so, that's ridiculous. I guess the way to overcome that would be just to move on to another venue. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. We're going to, uh, the way we're going to overcome it is we're just going to keep writing better music. We're going to get our numbers up and we're going to get in better venues. Yeah. What's your pre show slash post show ritual? How do you psych yourself up before a show and how do you wind down after it? I never really thought about that. I don't do warm ups or anything like that. I guess I'm slow. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> show up and ready to rock man i don't know uh do i have a pre-show not really i mean i have a certain way i dress that's about it you know like praise the fallen i wear a sleeveless shirt and stuff tore up jeans and then bostel i'm up it's more classy uh as far as a, a ritual or anything no well bostel at the end, end of every show we've been we crowd together and we bow, letting people know we thank them, kind of old school way, you know. Praise the Fallen don't really have a ritual, really. We just, uh, I don't know, it's natural for us. We just show up ready to rock, do our thing. and A sign of true professionalism, huh? I guess. I guess some professionals would actually do a vocal warm-up and stuff, but <laughs> I'm not every night either if i was on tour singing every night i would probably do that you know so I, i'm doing a show maybe twice a month you know so i i'm not i don't know i don't do any vocal warm-ups or anything i do i don't know like uh i opened for puddle of mud uh i think it was last year last november and i had just gotten over pneumonia and i guess there are some shows where i'll just do like a shot of jägermeister before the show i don't drink cold water you know if you if you uh hurt yourself you put cold water on it it's gonna it's gonna shrink it it's gonna restrict it so uh i guess that's it as far as any ritual really that's interesting interesting so you know in 30 years time you know you're at the end of your career it's coming to an end you need a zimmer frame on stage when you look back, what needs to have happened for you to feel completely fulfilled and happy? My whole thing, I tell people, uh, for me, I just want to leave a legacy of good songs behind. When I when I pass on, I'm hoping that people are still list, are listening to my stuff. Hell, hell, maybe more people will listen to it, you know, but. I'm hoping to to leave that behind to where people are listening to my music after I'm gone. We all leave something behind, whether it be family, whether it be children, you know, to carry our legacy or whatever. I I have these songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what are your future plans? You know, what's locked in stone? What can we expect from Bastel and Praise the Fall? I was talking to Wayne about this today with Bastel. Um, we're going to do some music videos. Uh, we got a new single coming out of this war. We're going to be doing a video for that. We want to do, we have, we have already had the plan that we plan on doing an EP every six months and we're going to put out one video a month and we're going to come out, we're going to come out swinging in March and we're going to get on 
at shows and getting some venues. We're also going to make an actual performance video and send it to some industry people uh, so they can see what we do. And then uh, Praise the Fallen is going to the studio January 14th. Uh, we're going to be recording. We're working with a guy named Nick Nativo out of uh, New Lenox, Illinois, at the Nook. We're going to record there, and then we're going to have our friend, Brandon Garrett, which you might want to interview these guys. They're called Autumn Academy. Have you heard of them? No, I haven't, actually. Oh, they're phenomenal, man. Autumn Academy. Brandon Garrett, songwriter for Autumn Academy. He's an amazing producer. And he's going to uh, mix and produce and master the, the next EP for Praise the Fallen. And I also told the guys in Praise the Fallen, we need to get some videos done. So we're going to work on our numbers on the playlist. Just it's all you can do, really, you know, get your numbers up to get more public attention, uh, more fans, basically. That's really our only plan to venture out and play newer venues that we haven't played too. So sounds like it's going to be a good year. Anyway, I can't, I actually, I'm looking forward to it genuinely. I can't wait to see the videos and I can't wait to hear the new music. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> so, I sent you some of the new, those are demos of stuff I'm working on. I am collaborating too. Like I said, I did that song with my friend that just passed from cancer and people in the local scene here liked it. And I've had some guitar players come, Hey man, we should get together. So then I got this Jamie Bostel with special guests. I'm doing that. And then I got Bostel and then I'm doing praise the fallen too. So whatever doesn't fit Bostel or PTF, I find a guitar player and we just collaborate and it's just fun. That's the way music should be, man. Exactly. Exactly. You should enjoy it. Yeah, just, I'm, the plan is just to put out as much music as possible. We'll dive into the last couple of questions, so before I let you go. If you could see any performer from history in concert for one night only, who would it be? I thought about this, and I think it would be Nirvana. <clears throat> A man after my own heart. Yeah, I, I just have to see Nirvana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I don't even have to ask why. I'd stare right near the top of my bucket list as well. Chad Channing, who played on the Bleach album, is actually one of my friends, and we talk now and then. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Oh, man. Jeez. I don't believe it, but it's true. Yeah, I got a hold of him because uh, Tad, the guy from Tad, Tad Doyle, he's on my Facebook. He has a recording studio called White Ape Studios in Seattle, and Chad does session work. Right. And I happened to see Chad was there were pictures of Chad doing some session work for Tad. So I hit him up. I'm like, hey, man, I sent you a friend request like two years ago. Right. And he actually messaged me back. I was like, what? <laughs> so we ended up talking. I talked to him up once in a while. I talked to him about his family, how he's doing. And he's dude, he's awesome, man. Awesome. Super down to earth guy, man. Yeah. We talk probably once a month. Yeah. Chad Chaney. Yeah. That's crazy. That is crazy. And um, the next one then. If you had to spend 24 hours locked in a room with any artist from history, who would it be? Man, I got, I thought about this and I thought two, I'm going to give you two of them, really. And it's not, I've, I've listened to your interviews and I've heard some, and I'm surprised I have not heard this yet, but I would say Billy Corgan. Right. You know what? It, now you say it, I haven't actually had that as an answer before, and it is surprising. I mean, why? Why wouldn't you? He's amazing. You know, he's an amazing songwriter. I've listened to his interviews about the music industry, and he's just so smart, man. <laughs> he's just like, and you know, and he rocks the same hairstyle as me. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, uh, you know, I have to ask, what would you hope to learn from him in those 24 hours? Oh, my God, man. I don't know, really. Just I've learned a lot from him already because he's so open. He's not afraid to say whatever's on his mind. That's why I respect him. 
You know, some people would think, oh, he's a pompous jerk or whatever. But some of the stuff that he has put out there about the music industry, I'm like, yeah, these people need to know the reality of being a rock star. I mean, I had a taste of that, too, when I worked with John from Lillian. You know, you know, this was long after the hair metal days were over and stuff. He was actually living with me in my apartment, you know. And he was a normal dude. He he painted houses with me. This was also in 08 when the economy crashed and stuff. We were painting houses together, dude. You know? And he told me back in the 80s, music videos cost 50 grand and stuff like that. And told me all these kinds of stories. But I learned, you know, because here he is living with me. He don't have no mansion. He ain't got no money, big money, you know, and stuff like that. I learned... Because here I am all those years. Yeah, you know, I want to be a rock star. And then I'm actually living, or I'm sorry, a rock star is living with me. You know, that's when I was like, okay. I had a little taste of, well, maybe it's not what it's cracked up to be, really. You know what I mean? I learned that. And I think it's funny now when people say, dude, you're going to make it. You're going to blow up. And like, my whole thing is, like I said, the reality sets. And it's like, yeah, well, as long as my rent's paid, my bills are paid, that's how I'm going to make it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think the thing is, once you've had a, a peek behind that curtain, you know, you're just happy to go on, as you said, paying your bills and feeding that creative itch. Right. And honestly, you know, as far as Billy Corgan and Dave Grohl, I would just like to jam with them. Oh, that would be fun. Because I can write, too. So I wonder what we create together, you know? Yeah. That could be cool, yeah. you know? I mean, no level but billy does live in illinois which isn't too far away from me you know and i'm kind of known in the region here maybe billy knows who i am i don't know that would be pretty cool and if he does hey billy if you're out there let's rock dude i'm i'm down <laughs> so what you're telling me for the first time i've asked that question there's actually a possibility of the guest spending 24 hours with the person hey man you never know, you know. I mean, I could try out to him, but he'd probably be. I mean, he can. He does it all himself. So, what would he need me for? <laughs> but it'd be cool to jam. I'd love to jam with Dave Grohl too. That'd be awesome. Yeah, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And the final one, then, what song would appear on the soundtrack to your life? Oh, I know, I know this, dude. I thought about this, and like. I saw some interview. You had some guys say Stairway to Heaven and, and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. But here's a song that a lot of people don't think about that I, I think sums up my life, man. And that's These Days by Foo Fighters. It's a good one, actually. Yeah. Read those lyrics. Yeah. One of these days, your heart will stop. Yeah. You know, I like that song. Yeah. <clears throat> Easy for you to say. Your heart has never been broken. Yeah. Yeah. Your pride's never been stolen. Yeah, I love that song. Because I've had that happen. You know, fall apart. I've had... When you are in a small area and you are doing all these big things, you do deal with some bullying. You deal with some gossip and crap talking. And so it's easy for you to say your pride's never been stolen. Your heart's never been broken. There you go. <laughs> perfect one so perfect we're gonna close out the show with uh the praise the fallen song degenerative types would you like to tell us a bit about it before we wrap up it's just about generation next how um i just feel like there are a lot of degenerates out there living for drugs and stuff like that but i also use it like symmetry for it like and I'm saying, what what gets you high? If music gets you high. Love gets you high. You know, what is your high? What you know? That's why I say, what gets you high at the end? I'm not talking about drugs, but I'm using the example of how I don't know, man. Some some of these people are uh, mm, just degenerates, wild, crazy. They have no path. They have no. Uh, they don't know where they're going. You know, we're also dealing with like the you know, the random shootings and stuff like that. And uh, I'm seeing that it's like a lot of younger people that are not education and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, I don't know. It's like a mixture of all that, you know, just a, a degenerate generation that's 
wild and, and uh, doesn't have a plan, I guess. Does that make sense? Perfect. <clears throat> Perfect sense. Right, Jamie, listen, it's been an absolute blast. I've genuinely enjoyed chatting to you now and getting an insight into your music. Awesome, man. You too. I am Matthew Thomas, the Spirit of Super Cool Radio, and if you're looking for a great podcast that features the best independent and up-and-coming bands and artists, then check out my podcast, Super Cool Radio. Each week, I deliver fun interviews, and every Friday, I spin some killer music. You might not know some of these bands that I feature, but I guarantee you will love them. Check out Super Cool Radio on YouTube, Rumble, Anchor, Spotify, iTunes, or the streaming platform of your choice. Tune in and rock out! Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. 
And if you're interested in signing up the Band Builder Academy, use the link in the show notes below and enter the code CONCERTS and you'll receive 10% off. So until next time, keep rocking. Hey, hey, what are you guys still doing there? The show is over. It's over. You can go home. Go on. We'll see you next time. We'll be here.